Well, we're going to be speaking about prayer, but as we do, I want to welcome you. If this is the first time you've been with us, welcome to Soul Harvest Church. We're so glad you're here. And uh, my name is Pastor Matt. By the way, that was my wife, Andrea, on the keyboard. And those of you watching online, we greet you. And all of you who are up in the balcony, we greet you and love you this morning. Thank you for coming to church today. And uh, what a joy to be the family of God together. We have more and more people with us now that have been part of our church for more than 10 years. And some now, it's 15 years. And we have some that have been part of our church for 15 minutes. And you know what? We welcome you. And I hope that you, if you say, you know what? I've discovered a body of believers to be full of faith and to grow in my faith with. So thank you for being here today, and God bless you. We're going to talk about prayer today. We've, we're in a, this is part three of our series, and uh, the title of our message that we're not going to get to is called 10 Steps to Sabotage Your Prayer Life. We will get to it, um, and I'll touch on it here in a little bit, but I don't know if you've ever watched Worldwide Wrestling Federation, now it's called WWE, and uh, when the person, the wrestler dude, has somebody that's acting like they're passed out on the floor or on the, you know, on the mat of the, of the wrestling ring. And, you know, they've been beaten up a little bit and they're just laying there. And then the big wrestler dude gets up and he climbs up to the top rope. And, you know, and there he comes and he does this flying leap and maybe it's the atomic elbow or whatever. And he's going to just jump on the guy who's already passed out because that's what we do. And I almost felt as I was reading my Bible and my personal devotions yesterday <laughs> that I got body slammed by this verse of Scripture, and I want to just share it with you because I think it's so fitting for our message on prayer. Now, before I do, <laughs> many of you have already heard about the bear. You know I like bears, but there was a, a, a particular bear. There was a hunter out in the woods. <laughs> this is a very true story, very theologically accurate. But this hunter was out hunting, and here comes a bear. And the bear begins to charge him. And so the hunter thinks, no problem. So he gets out his gun, and his gun jams. And there's nothing he can do. So he just says, Lord, we're about to meet a bear here. I just, I'll tell you what, Lord, I pray right now that you make this bear a Christian bear. And so this bear is just charging you know, on all fours, just coming. At, you know, they've been running at 30 miles an hour. And the bear gets to him, and the man is just holding on and saying, Lord, make it a Christian bear. And sure enough, as soon as the bear gets right before the man, the bear stops in its tracks. And it puts a, a smile on his face, and he kind of gets down on his knees to pray. And he says, Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless the meal I'm about to partake of. <laughs> That's one of the oldest jokes in the book, but it sure is a good one. <laughs> Here to teach you about prayer today, our need for prayer. I want to turn, and we're going to go a little unscripted. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. And I want to open up our message with Daniel today. <laughs> and I want you to be reminded that Daniel was the one who refused to stop praying and therefore was subsequently thrown into a lion's den. And when he was, the Lord held back those lions. And Daniel slept like a baby. And the next day when the king came to check on him, they said, oh my goodness, well Daniel's God is alive. And then they threw all the people that were attacking Daniel into that lion's den. And they were the ones who experienced the wrath of those lions. And I want to just, this is, we'll just take a little side trip here. Let's look at verse 1. <laughs> it pleased Darius. Now, right there, there's, there's different kings in the book of Daniel. And I want to note here that each one of these kings was an ungodly king. Okay? And Darius is, I believe, the third king we're going to see introduced in the book of Daniel that Daniel, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were under as slaves. See, I want you to understand something. Just from, you say, but Darius, that's a five-point series right there. See, but Darius, 
that this King Darius, just because somebody in your life is ungodly, doesn't mean that God's not in it. Amen. You may have an ungodly boss, okay? You may have an ungodly governor, but that does not mean that God is not in it or cannot use you in that situation. Amen. Okay? Sometimes people say, I wish I could, I could be like you, pastor, and I could be a pastor and work with Christians all day. Wouldn't that be great? Hallelujah. You know where, you know, you ever figure out where liars go? They go to church every Sunday morning. It pleased Darius, chapter 6, verse 1, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, that would be like governors, to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius lived forever. All the governors of this kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign it in the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom from the early days. I read that this week, and it has not left me. There are so many aspects to this passage, and, and I'm going to do it a severe injustice today, just because it, it's deeper than I have time to get into. But I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today about our dire need to pray. Our dire need to be before God. We've all heard an account at somewhere, most of us, about Daniel and the lion's den. And kind of the way that it goes over time, if you don't study it directly is, oh yeah, there was this one guy and he didn't pray and they threw him in the lion's den and God saved him. And that's good. That, that, that's a, you can get to heaven off of that. But I want to teach you a little deeper. First of all, the, the command that was signed by the king was only good for 30 days. One month. I don't know about you, but that hit me like a rock. Can I tell you, and, and, and I mean, let, let's, let's be transparent, let's be honest with each other today. Most pastors are trying to get their congregation to pray a couple times in 30 days. When we study statistically, even pastors are guilty at this time in our history of praying less than three minutes per day, okay? And, you know, like if you remember my point from last week, one key to unanswered prayer is don't pray. And everybody wants to complain, oh, our nation is getting so bad. Yes, our nation is getting very, very bad. It is alarmingly bad. But when we don't pray, it's going to continue to get bad. But even in Daniel's time, the nation was bad, but Daniel, through prayer, changed the nation. 
And so, number one, Daniel was not willing to go 30 days without prayer. I mean, to me, how many of y'all know that would be a compromise that we could justify if we wanted to? We, oh, 30 days, well, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to offend the world. 30 days, you know, that's not that. I'll just, I'll just keep it to myself. I'll pray under my breath. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to cause a scene. After all, God's a God of love, and I have to just, I have to be accepting and tolerant. And what did Daniel do? He goes upstairs, and he opens the window. Not once, not twice, Three times. And, and he gets, and, and he opens the window and clearly people can see him, people can hear him, and he has the audacity in front of his window. Now there are some people who, this will make you mad, some people are like, well I thought we were supposed to go into our closet to pray. Well yeah, go into your closet to pray, but there is a time your prayer stand makes a difference. And Daniel, and, and I, want, I want to verbal, I want you to physically see this with your eyes. I want you to see this. Because I believe this means something. But Daniel, three times, as was his custom since he was a child, got down on his knees to pray. And he humbled himself. You know, what does it mean when we get on our knees? means surrender, means humility, means prostrateness. And he gets down and he calls on God. And I think about how this Daniel in an ungodly system serving an ungodly king who had a custom of praying and clearly they were powerful prayers. But what does the Bible say about him? He had an excellent spirit. And he was promoted above everyone else. Can, can I share with you a, a, just a key, a key to life, church? Let me help you. When you, the body of Christ, pray. When you pray the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person. There is no devil in hell that can keep you down and you will excel way above and beyond those of this world system. Amen. I want you to know that. You know, I, I've challenged you here to pray for your children. The book of Daniel chapter 1 that says that your children would be anointed with wisdom and knowledge and skill and understanding and aptitude for every kind of learning. And even what the Bible says about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would be 10 times better than other men. Listen, the people of God ought to be 10 times better than the people of this world system. And when you, the people of God, will recognize, and when me, the pastor of God, recognizes that this power we have available to us, when we hit our knees and call on the grace of an almighty God, there is no power in in this world that can stop us or keep us down. He was set above. It says he had an excellent spirit. I would just stop there and teach for a moment. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't, I don't want anybody to, to, to feel bad, but I will tell you that when we are people of prayer, when we're people of faith, it will cause excellence to rise up in us. Now, that doesn't mean you start there, but when you've been a born-again Christian for a long time and you have a faith and you have a reliance on the Word of God, it will begin to produce better things in your life. I'm not talking about materially. I'm talking about the way we conduct our life. Listen, I, I love you. I love you. But listen, if you're a born-again believer, don't be among the flock that goes to Walmart in your pajamas. Listen, you know, when I think about a spirit of excellence, what, 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 what is a spirit of excellence? It's, it's order, not chaos. It's up and coming, not down and out. It's on time or early. It's having a plan. 
It's getting things done. It's saying, it's doing what you said you were going to do. I think about a born again believer who's a person of prayer, who's a person of integrity in the kingdom of God. They're going to rise up in that excellence. You know what? It's okay to demand excellence as a pastor. It's okay to demand that, you know what, if we're going to serve God, Psalms 150, God is great and what? Greatly to be praised. That greatly to be praised defines how we serve God. And I think if we're going to be people of prayer, calling on God, identifying as I'm a spirit-filled, born-again believer, there ought to be excellence oozing out of us. How would you like it? How would you like it if the pilot to your plane showed up to fly that plane like some Christians show up to do church? Amen. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad those airplane pilots take it real serious, don't they? I mean, they have checks. They, they, there's no shortcutting. As a matter of fact, if you're a pilot and you start shortcutting and you stop missing checks on your boxes, they're going to fire you very quickly. Why? Because there's no chance. They're not taking any chances. I don't know about you, but in the things of God, how many of y'all know we ought to do what we're called to do and do it with a willing and excellent heart? Amen. Amen. As much as I love pilots, as much as I love flying, how many of y'all know that gospel ministry is more important than airplane ministry? Amen. Amen. So it's okay as a people of faith to say, you know what, excellence is okay. Now what is, ex excellence is not perfection. If you have a perfectionist spirit, that's not excellence. Okay, that's selfishness. Okay, there's a lot of other things that go with that. That's pride, but it's not God. What is excellence? Excellence is doing the best you can possibly do with what you had to work with. Excellence is a relative concept. Listen, for here in this culture, how many of y'all like those seats you're sitting in? Isn't that great? Now, now uh, I got to tell you when, when, when you, when you, when you travel outside the United States, they don't know what those kind of chairs are. Padded chairs, what's that? Padded air conditioning, what's that? But you know what? When, when, when we get in Africa, they don't get chairs, they stand. And in churches, they'll have, uh, if it's a crusade, they stand. But if it's a church, they have the, the, you know, the kind of the plastic patio chairs they sell at Walmart or Dollar General for about, what, six, seven dollars a chair? That, that's what they have. And guess what? It's the best they have. That, that's a great honor to have a chair like that. Uh, when you go to the Caribbean, they don't even have plastic chairs. What do they have? They have old wooden beams, two by sixes. Nailed, they have a two by six this way, and sometimes they have a two by six that represents the back, and sometimes they don't. What is that? That's called the best they have, but they're clean. They're clean. They don't, they don't have all this cool sound stuff, and they don't have, they don't have uh, all, all the instruments we have, but I'll tell you what, you know what they have? They have their feet, and they have their hands, and buddy, you go praise and worship in Jamaica, and it, it, it is a whole congregational affair, and they, they just have this stuff they do with rhythm that we just can't do here. But I mean, they, they're getting their, they're, they, they stomp on these wood, clapboard, wood floors, and they clap. And, and, and sometimes they'll make a, a, a couple different sounds with their mouth, that, like, like a whistle or, or a, a, with stomping and clapping and mouth sound. They, they make their own music, praise God. And it's wonderful. It's the best they have. That's what excellence is. You see, excellence is doing the very best. So if, if we have the ability to bless you with padded seats, how many of y'all know we ought to? And how many of y'all know they ought to be straight? You, when you walk in here, do you notice all these chairs? They're straight. It's not because of you, I can assure you. <laughs> but you know, we have ladies that come, and they love you so much. They love Jesus so much. They come every week, and they straighten the chairs. And they put, they, they stuff the envelopes and the bolt, the things in the, the chairs because they love you so much. They do that. Why? Because excellence. We have people, that come, look, let's look around. There's no dirt on that floor. There's none. You know, you got 400 people in here on a Sunday and, 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 and they won't, by next Sunday, it'll be spotless. Isn't that great? It's excellence. That's not me doing it. That's people, the people of God doing it because they love Jesus. We have excellence, you see. 
So I believe if we're going to have the Spirit of God, I think a spirit of prayer will produce excellence in our lives. I'm moving on. I can't spend too much time there. Oh, my. Verse 4. I want to put you on notice. Verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel. I, I, want, I want your eyes to be opened a little bit today. If I could just be modern for just a second, and I don't do this well, but I want to help you today to be woke. <laughs> it, that just feels weird saying that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, forgive me if I have sinned. <laughs> but by woke, I mean we need to realize how things really work. And there's a lie that's been propagated that tells us that we as Christians are aggressors, that we are mean to people, that we oppress people. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the biggest fat lie I've ever heard. I want you to see something here. Daniel was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was leading righteously even in an unrighteous system. And because he excelled, what did the people of the world system do? They brought the fight to Daniel. Do you catch that? The people of the world system brought the fight to Daniel. If you were to look up Genesis chapter 19, you would see in the city of Sodom where Lot lived, who was a righteous man, and his family. You will see when the angels visited Sodom, now, Lot did some very foolish things, and he brought the angels into his house, and he was not supposed to do that. But you see the evil men of that city, and, and we know what Sodom was known for. The evil men of that city, they did not attack Lot in the government. They did not attack him in the open square. They took it to his house. And they came to Lot's house. And they beat on the door. And they said, send those men out that we may know them carnally. In other words, we're going to forcefully take from you what is yours. And we're going to bring them into ungodly and unwholesome, and debauchery, and immorality, and we're going to rape them. I want you to understand, church, the times that we're living. I want you to get woke. The spirit of this world is ruled by the spirit of Antichrist. I said, I, you said, I thought the Antichrist was going to come in the end. The book, the, the first John tells us the spirit of Antichrist has already gone out into the world. The Antichrist is still coming, but the spirit is already here. And the spirit of Antichrist is what? Antichrist. And so when you begin demonstrating Christ, the anti will come in because the anti hates the Christ. You see that? So we see in Genesis 19 that righteous Lot with two angelic beings in his home, they attacked him in his home and attempted to forcefully take him and hurt them. Okay? Daniel, they attacked him. Let, let me give you a modern, and, 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 and let me help you to get woke. Oh, I, 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 I want you to be careful who you listen to. There's a whole lot of fake news out there. But 
Let me give you something that's been out of the Islamic playbook for a long time. Attack, 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 attack. And when they retaliate, play the victim card. They've done that to Israel. And even this thing with Iran that's happened recently. And, 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 and look, I'm not here to play politics. But listen, this is national security. I want you to understand that number one, and a full, when we have an embassy on any other country, the international law says that is U.S. property. Same way with if Russia has an embassy here in the United States, that is Russian property. And if, if, if you're a Russian citizen, okay, and you walk out onto the main street, USA, of where your embassy is located, probably New York, Washington, D.C., and, and you hold a gun out in broad daylight, and you pulled it to Jason McKinney, and you pull the trigger and shoot him dead. Everybody sees you do it. You can walk right back into the Russian embassy, and there's not a thing the United States can do without your government's permission. You understand? An embassy is a national, it, it is a place where they have sovereign power from its sending nation and immunity. And when the embassy comes under an attack, that is an attack on the United States of America. How many things have been shot down? How many things, how many terrorist attacks have been carried out? Boom, 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 boom. And finally, when you say, you know what, we're, we're, you forced our hand. We have to respond to say, this is not okay. Amen. And they say, well, how dare he take out these poor little victims? That's wrong. Okay, that's wrong. Uh, my daughter Hannah, her best friend in Bible college, uh, her best friend's boyfriend was in Iraq when the, when the missiles were coming in. He was one of the ones that got forced into the bunker. You know, we have real people, real Americans over there that were targeted. Okay? This is real. That's some, uh, two weeks ago, there was a serviceman, a young man in Chicago, in Kenya, who was killed on an attack on an airfield from terrorists. This is real, folks. This is real. And I want you to understand, in this world we live, evil will attack Christians. Do you see that? I think, I, think, I think about the thing that happened with Kim Davis in Kentucky. She's the one, the clerk, a clerk of a court, making probably $25,000 a year. And here she is as a clerk court, and she has the authority to sign her name that somebody, that, that the state recognizes a marriage. And I want you to know that the day that the Supreme Court errantly ruled to legalize gay marriage, I, I want you to know the LGBT agenda already knew where they could go to make a scene. Because those people that were applying for marriage licenses in that little town in Kentucky were not from that little town in Kentucky. They were activists from other places, and what did they do? They came to attack. Do you understand? And back in 2012, the whole mantra was, hey, man, we just want equal rights. Hey, man, just leave us alone. We just want to live and let live. How many of y'all know you're hearing today, if you don't let us preach, if you, if you say we're wrong in your church, we want to take away your tax-exempt status? Now, I'm not here to put down the LGBT. They do that themselves very well. But I am here. And listen, if you're LGBT and you're watching today, you know you're miserable. I'm going to talk to you for a second. You know right now. You know. You know what I'm saying is truth. And you've lived your whole life based on a lie. And everything you do is a lie. It's all about getting attention because you've been rejected and you've been hurt. And you know what I say is true.
And I love you enough to tell you the truth because I want to save you from an eternal hell. There is a place called hell. It's a lake of fire. It's where the worm dies not. There's an eternal stench. You'll fall and fall and fall. There is no hope. There is no touch of water to dip a tab on your tongue. It is a place of eternal suffering and torment. And Jesus Christ died on a cross to set you free from that lifestyle. And you can come out of it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. If you will repent and ask the Holy Spirit to convict you and to help you and to change you because that's not who God created you to be. That is a lie from the pit of hell and you know it and I know it. Quit believing a lie and you'll start believing the truth and maybe you'll get woke. (laughs) And I want to say to the church, quit being a bunch of tolerant sissies. You are not going to allow your eight-year-old boy to come into the bathroom with my eight-year-old girl. It's not going to happen. Not in the name, I'm not going to, oh, in the name of top, listen. Daniel didn't preach tolerance. He said, I know what y'all's laws are, but I don't care. I don't care. Okay? Now that doesn't mean we don't love them. That doesn't mean we don't hug them. It doesn't mean we don't welcome them in this congregation. But at some point, somebody has to say, you know what, sugar? You believe the lie. And listen here, young man. Makeup doesn't belong on your face. And you ought not to paint your nails. And you ought not to walk like you have a corn cob shoved up your rear end. And listen here, young lady, it's okay to be pretty. God made you pretty. Stop trying to be ugly. You have to try hard to be that ugly. But you know, you know what Paul said? Paul prayed this. He said, Lord, deliver me from wicked and unreasonable people. And you know what? When wickedness comes in, listen, where, where does wisdom start? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When there is no fear of the Lord, there can be no wisdom. And so when Paul said wicked and unreasonable, if you're wicked, you're going to be unreasonable. I've heard many people say, I tried to argue with this person, but it's like talking to a brick wall. What is that? They can't see the truth. Why? Because they're blinded to the truth, because their eyes are closed, because they have no fear of the Lord. Where there is wickedness, there is unreason. It makes no... I, we've got people in this nation apologizing to a terrorist. Do you know how stupid that is? You're stupid. So, Pastor, I thought we weren't supposed to say stupid in church. How about I bring out some King James words then? You want me to go all King James and Jesus on them? Because I can. You really won't like that. If you want to apologize, listen, I just got to tell you, I mean, I don't mean to go here, but just, you know, the other day we had a, we had a lady here going through a tough time. Maybe I won't say tough time. But some situations changed in her life and she had to move. And with just a few phone calls, we had six or seven people able to help out and help her get moved. I was, and they moved in the rain even. I just want to say to Michael Moore, since you hate this country so much, I got 300 and 400 people right here right now. We will show up and help you move. <laughs> if you hate this country so bad, this revelation came to me yesterday. I was, I was at the, the fairground. And I was so blessed to be a part of that. If it not, that the sea bar sea, and I pray and meet with them. We had, I, don't, I haven't seen Matthew Watson here today. He might still be working, but uh, he's one of our guys. He's in the National Guard. He had the privilege to hold the Indiana flag during the colors. So proud of him. And I was just staring at the, uh, all the American flags and the patriotism that was in that place and just taking it all in. And I was thinking about my, my, my own son who's in the military. And I've heard it said before, 
people say, well, who've served and even had people give their lives and say, we served so we could give people the right to act like that. There's some truth to that, but let, let, me, let me say it a different way. They served so that you have the right to leave if you don't like it. Amen. Amen. Do you, do you, and, and this happened, though, I, 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 we're not going to get to the message today. <laughs> but th- this happened recently, folks. Th- this, th- this happened just, just a couple weeks ago. Now, this shouldn't have happened. A guy, a, a right winger, did something stupid. He went up to a place displaying a rainbow flag. And he stole the rainbow flag off of that place. He shouldn't have done that. Now, when I was a kid, I don't know about you, we stole things all the time. We stole stop signs. We stole all sorts of flags. We stole mascots from other schools. I even stole a buoy out of a lake. That was my crowning moment. We stole cars. Uh... He burnt the flag. Shouldn't have done that. Listen, as I'm teaching these things, I'm teaching truth because I believe people, and, and, and some of you here with gray hair, I don't have to take much convincing to you, but every now and then, for the sake of our younger people, you just have to say some things real point blank to say, oh yeah, wait a second, that makes sense. Okay? But the man who did that got 15 years in jail. 15 years as a hate crime. Now, should have been punished, yeah. But I don't understand how when you burn my American flag, that is not an attack of a terrorist or a traitor on my nation. If you're going to put that out there, and as a nation, the, the, the depravity of setting up that kind of special status for an abomination is wrong. When we allow people to trample over our blessed red, white, and blue that your sons and your daughters have given their lives to defend, that there are people here within Putnam County who are permanently injured for the sake of freedom around this world. And I have a problem with that. I do. So, I want to continue just briefly. And, and when you look at, go back here, King Darius, let, let, let me share this. Uh, I know we live in a very conservative area politically. That doesn't mean we're all conservatives. And I've heard people say and think, well, Pastor, how could somebody be a Christian and vote a certain way? And I understand that. But you know what they say is, how could you be a Christian and vote for somebody who's less than perfect or that's done evil things? And that's absolutely true. So how do you? Let let, let me share this with you. Number one, we have to recognize that God chooses people even when they're not perfect. Okay. Number two, we have to recognize that even though a leader may be ungodly, God can still use them. Okay. And number three, I will tell you this. Be careful was saying, well, if you vote that way, you're not a Christian. Because what I see is those who call on the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And we're so stinking that we've allowed the media to divide us over all this stuff, and the politicians are getting rich, and we're getting ripped off. But I will share this with you. And I say this lovingly, as you study the word and study the Bible, 
it will bring a very clear picture on how God wants things to work. And as you study the scripture, at, there are things in here about welfare. There are things in here about working. There are things in here about uh, things like abortion. There are things in here about national issues. There are things in here that affect every area of our life. You say, well, I'm not so sure we should use the Bible, really, because all of our founding fathers will tell you the greatest single influence on our Constitution, on our Declaration of Independence, and on our Bill of Rights came out of the B-I-B-L-E. And when you read the Federalist Papers, the Federalist Papers are what the framers of our Constitution wrote to, to tell you how they wrote the Constitution and why they wrote the Constitution and why they put this in here and not that. When you read the explanation of the why, you will see overwhelmingly the why is we believe we are called to be a lighthouse to the world. Amen. Amen. Well, I just think the separation of church and state. Well, show me that in the Constitution. Well, it's the First Amendment. No, it's not. Liar, liar, liar. See, but when there's the beginning of wickedness, it becomes unreasonable. You, can't, you, you have no reason because you have no authority of the fear of the Lord in your life. And therefore, there is no truth in you, you see. Well, I wrote down four sentences out of Daniel 6. I got 12 pages of notes and this little section right here is what I just preached. I need to be done. Uh, we'll come back and hit that message after Phil Yeoman is here. It was good. Uh, I want to. I want to. Though, as we close, I, I, I ministered uh, on New Year's Eve uh, over in Ohio with my dear father, uh, spiritual father, Pastor Dosick. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church before, and, and every year they come out, that like, like the pastors come out and say, I believe this is what is going to happen this year, I predict kind of a thing. And, and uh, I've heard some guys are right on, I've heard some guys are off, and I've heard all sorts, everybody, you know, is saying 2020, that's the year of vision. Have y'all heard that? All right, well, praise God. Did God really say that, or is that just convenient because of the year 2020? I don't know. I know the Lord has been speaking to me to teach to you how to live in victory in your life. And we're going to, after I get done with this series on prayer, I'm going to go into a series, and I've, it's diagrammed. I've started to diagram, and I'm thinking, it keeps getting bigger and longer, but I've got 12 sessions right now of how to teach you to live in victory in every area of your life. Um. But as, as we were there, and Pastor Dosek got up, and he shared, he said, I, I feel, I sense an urgency in my heart that we as the body of Christ need to pray and prepare because persecution is coming. And I can see that. He said, well, was that bad? Well, only if you're a carnal-based Christian. But if your hope is in the Lord and you understand there's hope beyond this life and the worst thing anybody can do to you is send you to heaven and it's a joy and a glory to suffer for Christ, then it's not that big of a deal. It hurts. You don't ever want to go through it. I don't want to see my children go through it, I can tell you that. You know. But Peter said rejoice, you know, when it comes. But I want to say, and this is, I guess, why Daniel... So jumped out at me, and I've been studying uh, all year. Last year, I studied the book of Jeremiah several times and Ezekiel. And there were times in those books where even the holy prophets, full of power and might, could not restrain God's people from living foolishly. And there came a time where they just had to say, okay, have it your way. 
I really hope and pray we don't get here in this nation. I will say right now there's a resolution in the Methodist church right now to split over the LGBT thing. I will break fellowship with them over that if that's the case. And I'm all for church unity, but not at the sake of the Bible. Amen. Not at the sake of the Word of God. I love people. I want to do everything I can to help people. I want, I'll work with other churches. But, but if you're going to celebrate an abomination and ordain people who God has rejected and say these are the prophets of God, these are the holy men and women of God, I reject you because Christ has rejected you. I'll pray for you. I love you, but we will not fellowship. Amen. I would not take communion with them. If, if they come out and, and, uh, and pass that, which most likely they will, I, I will be done. And I would say to every Methodist pastor, if you call yourself a born-again believer, if, you call, if you're going to a Methodist church and, that's happened, and that happens, you need to leave the church that day. That day. Absolutely. Say, so, well, what if we lose our building? Oh, is your building more important than the Word of God? What if I lose my pension? When did our pension, when did preaching for a pension ever occur in the New Testament? Why don't you come, on up, come over and be with me? I don't have a pension, praise God. <laughs> I'm going to work till I'm 95, praise God. I'll be up here. There, there, hey, the whippersnapper is turning your Bible down. <laughs> My pension is one of y'all going to win the lottery, praise God, and give the church a big money. <laughs> That's a joke. I do not encourage you to play the lottery. <laughs> I discourage you. But I, I, want, I, I want to come back, though, to remembering that this Christianity, this thing we call this faith, and I started it off in the beginning about praise and worship. It's not a feeling. It's a discipline. Prayer is a discipline. Fasting is a discipline. And holding to the pattern of truth in a culture that has rejected it is a discipline. Okay? And we're called to be disciple, which literally translates disciplined ones. Okay? So I got to let you go. Oh, we've had, we've had church today. Amen. We've had church today. I just, we've had church. It feels good. I'm, I'm not, and with my talk today, I'm not empowering you. I'm not empowering you to go out and slander people and to post a bunch of junk news stuff on the internet that is critical and untrue. I'm not empowering you to make fun of the personalities of leaders. I think those things ought to be restrained as the body of Christ. I'm empowering you to love with truth. I'm empowering you to pray with passion. I'm empowering you to be a disciplined one so they will see there's something different about you. That's what I'm empowering you to do. Okay? So I love you, and here's the challenge I've been trying to get to to leave you with. I'm going to ask the Lord uh, to really guide me in this. And I'm going to ask him to guide you. I'm not ready to make a declaration. We ought to think very carefully before we commit to something because our yes needs to be our yes and our no needs to be our no. But I'm really thinking about this. Daniel prayed three times a day, kneeling down. And there's just something to that that's sticking with me. And I want to ask us as a, as a body today, as you leave, would you ask the Holy Spirit that if there's anything he wants you to do with that scripture, to, to bring it to your remembrance, to, to quicken your spirit. And Not everybody's going to pray three times a day, but maybe we need to set aside 10 minutes a day and kneel down. And you say, well, what will I pray? You know what? Maybe you just start by kneeling. And you just say, I'm going to set my alarm on my cell phone for 10 minutes. And I'm going to kneel down. I don't know what to say. But I'm going to kneel in a position of surrender. Or I'm going to kneel in a position of reverence to God. 
And then if he speaks to me, I'll say it. Or if it comes to mind, I'll say it. But I'm going to start there. But I think the Holy Spirit is on that somewhere for each one of us. And I want to ask you today as you go and as you have your quiet times this week to pray and ask the Lord to show you what he would have you to do with that little passage of Scripture. Daniel knelt three times a day, as was his custom since he was a youth. Okay? Let's pray for you today. Let's stand. I leave tomorrow. Um, I'll be gone for a few days. I'm going to uh, Latvia, former Soviet Union, and Bulgaria. And I'll be preaching. These won't be mass crusades. I'll be strengthening the churches. I'll be at the largest churches in Latvia, and I will be at uh, some up-and-coming churches in Bulgaria. And I'm going to be trying to give them for one day what you get 52 Sundays a year, okay? And uh, help raise them up, praise God, and strengthen those local churches. Would you pray for me as I'm gone? Would you pray for my safety and protection and anointing that God would be upon me? And then as soon as I get back, our Brazil team's going, so you pray for them. And, uh, well, we leave you in capable hands. Phil, you will be here next Sunday. And you'll love Phil. You might like him a lot better than me. Maybe he'll get done at 1130. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, man. You know what Pastor Parsley used to ask us when he was flowing? And he could tell it was time to be done, but he didn't want to quit. He'd say, why, do you want, why are you in such a hurry to get back to hell anyways? Because <laughs> i got to tell you, I don't want to quit, man. We are, I am wound up. Hallelujah. But we got to go. I love you today. I love you. Jesus loves you. And no matter where you are, what you're going through, there's somebody watching right now. I know exactly your name. Your initials start with an E. Last initial is N. And God is speaking to you right now and saying, come home, sinner. Come home. And uh, I'll just tell you right now, God is moving in this congregation, and I'm going to dismiss, but there's some of you, the Lord's been dealing with you all service about something. I don't know what it is, but I know he's dealing with you, and he would love for you to give that thing to him and surrender today. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you today. I praise you for this precious congregation. I pray for these lambs of God. I pray for our little children. And as we go, I pray your protective covering over them. I pray in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, would guide us and shape us. Help us to have an attitude of repentance. Help us to have an attitude of submission and surrender. And Lord, help us to be disciplined. Not just serving you because it's convenient or because of a feeling, but serving you because we will do it even if it costs us our life. We thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Hey, we'll have some folks up here to pray with you. If you need prayer for anything, otherwise I'll see you out in the foyer. We're dismissed. This moment and say thank you so much for tuning in to the ministry of Soul Harvest Church Online. And it's a privilege to minister to you each and every time. And I just want to invite you to be a living and active part of our vision to touch the world from West Central Indiana. And if you've been blessed by our ministry, I would ask you to very strongly consider sowing into our ministry to provide that our ministry would continue to go deeper and wider to impact people just like you all around this world that cost the precious blood of Jesus. So I would appreciate a gift of any amount. And, and I would ask if you're on YouTube, click the link below. If you're online on our website, click a, a Give Online. Or if you're on our app, hit the Give Online tab, and it'll take you through a couple easy steps, and you'd be able to sow. And we just pray God's richest blessing on you today. Thank you. God is good. His word is true. And it works in your life, friend.